So there's a lot of people right now who are getting ADHD diagnosis. If you took their smartphones away from them for two weeks, apparently it's two weeks, their ADHD symptoms go away. People with autism often experience social situations in overwhelm because they don't know what the manual is. They don't know what the right response is and they have to work it out in real time, which is slow and draining. Like I will always try and find like a narrative to make sense of things. And I will always try and find a narrative that makes sense you know, at a purely psychological level, cultural, spiritual. Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Breaking Point Podcast. Today we are here with Alistair, aka Copilot AI, and we're going to have a chat as we've just been talking. Alistair isn't exactly sure what we're going to have a chat about, and that's fair enough, because I didn't give him much, um, what would you say, preparation or warning, so I appreciate him for being here despite that but I do think some of the best episodes as some of you may think come when there isn't a lot of preparation but I think we're mainly going to have a chat about ADHD and sort of lots of things to do with that because one of the things I've noticed about you Alistair is that you take a topic of of the top the topic of ADHD and you span out to like areas that you you clearly know your stuff on that topic because if you look at, when I look at your TikTok you're you're talking about things that are very sort of disparately I would assume aren't really associated with ADHD but you managed to piece it back to ADHD um very well and obviously obviously it's anything to do with the brain anything to do with the brain is very uh expansive so Alistair why don't you tell people why you set up your TikTok and why you've taken a particular interest in what you've taken an interest in I wasn't happy to also thanks for you know setting this up it's um it's always good to bang on about all stuff thank you share the work um absolutely I think it's probably worth naming that you know I'm diagnosed I'm also ADHD um so I have a fair dose of the autism as well as the ADHD okay the and ADHD. the reality is, yeah AUDHD um so I think looking back over my life it's pretty clear that like the brain and how we work has been my special interest so I am just a geek about all this stuff so I did psychology and AI at uni I um I thought I would f- solve the brain I remember saying that to my director of studies once that I was going to go and solve the brain So I love all the science of it. And then when I was older, in my 30s, I retrained as a psychotherapist. So I then brought kind of the angle of like, okay, we know a lot of science about this stuff. But actually, a lot of the human experience is way beyond what we can do with science at the moment. And I can bang on about why that is mathematically the case. Um, We're complex systems. Science today isn't terribly good at interrogating complex systems. We have to approach differently. I kind of think if we think take both angles, the science and the therapy, we end up with a much richer view of where people are coming from. And that I've always been fascinated by. And then, quite frankly, turned 40, had a whole load of life stuff happen to me. Um, Endings, lots of endings happened at that time. And I kind of had a choice in life, like, you know, why am I alive? What do I care about? What matters? And I'd been looking for years to try and harmonize you know, my, because I ended up being a, a web developer and, you know, just building software. So I wanted to harmonize all this stuff I was interested in with my technical skills and some way of making money. Um, I decided, sort of, turned 40, I was like, wow, this shit will get off the pot time. So I decided to do the startup and I had an idea that is the kernel behind my Copilot AI. And I thought that could work and I pushed it. And then I'm a TikTok addict. So, uh, I kind of think that TikTok's a little bit like the 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 campfire for ADHD is, uh, especially when you think about like lights and moths. We get drawn to that campfire like moths get drawn to a candle, and we burn ourselves in the campfire of TikTok. But we also need it for our kind of connection with other people and like understanding ourselves because that's like ADHD and TikTok belong to each other. Most people with ADHD now, especially late diagnosed, probably got it because they are on TikTok and realized, oh, that, I, I recognize that. So TikTok is kind of like a natural place to go and bang on about this stuff. Do you think that um, TikTok sort of facilitates 
like a ADHD culture in the sense that it isn't just people with ADHD. We'll, we'll get onto this because I, I, I'd like you to explain more what sort of ADHD is, um, technically maybe. But obviously, the the medium is the message, which is what some some guy said, some Canadian guy. And obviously, the medium mm-hmm. of TikTok is instant swiping. So, do you think that dopamine? Sure, it's dopamine. And therefore, would you say that the idea that we have an ADHD culture or that people and more and more people are being diagnosed with ADHD, do you think there's a stigma to what? No, what's the word? And maybe an over diagnosis because we just exist in a culture now where uh, immediate gratification is so is on dem- is so or would you say it's at our fingertips and therefore yeah so i would always like i will always try and find like a narrative to make sense of things and i will always try and find a narrative that makes sense you know at a purely psychological level cultural spiritual you know the 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 the, the felt experience of the human being without like necessarily having the science but let's also bring in the science and when you've got a narrative that works in both of those then I'm like, okay, now you're cooking with gas. That makes sense, or that's got reasons to believe. If you've got a story that makes sense in one that doesn't make sense in the other, I'm like, okay, cool, theory, but maybe not, you know, doesn't have the gravitas, doesn't have the backing. So I would lean, my take on this is that, yes, our culture is incredibly dopamine hungry, but there are very concrete reasons for that, that... Um, are essentially unavoidable. So let's start with the basic observation that dopamine is there to make you essentially hunt um, fresh fruit. It's there to give you reward when you go and do something that's going to get you something. Mm -hmm. So it's the brain's mechanism for going, yo, look over there, go back to that bush, or don't go back to that bush yet because you've kind of just had that hit. It's probably not going to have any fruit because you've rinsed it already. So dopamine is designed to help us live in a world where food is hard to find to help us go and get the food. Yes. So it's a time of scarcity. Dopamine is built for scarcity. We live in a world of abundance where dopamine is trivially easy to get hold of. So I think this all starts with button pressing console games in our homes as teenagers back in the eighties. If you grew up with the ability to press a button to get a dopamine kick, that's kind of the point where I think the world starts changing for those of us who have that experience. Before that, you couldn't press a button and get dopamine. You just couldn't. You had to go and make your own fun. You had to get bored as a kid. You had to go and, you know, invent complex games. But as soon as you've got a Sega Mega Drive or a Nintendo, you just press a button and boom, there's your dopamine. Your brain's going to learn that. The problem we've got is that our brains had n- have never, in the history of evolution, had any need to evolve a antagonist to dopamine what that means is it's never had to evolve something that suppresses dopamine because it's never been a good idea to suppress dopamine because we live in a world of scarcity historically and it's always a good idea to go hunting the things that might give us a reward always why on earth would we have ever evolved anything that goes do you know what i've had enough like of this amazing fresh fruit right now you don't do that you just keep eating it like until the bush is done so because of that lack of a an intrinsic ability for our brains to say hey i've had enough dopamine as soon as we start inventing button pressing dopamine we we kind of create this slide towards a world where we're going to be drawn towards that and because we're drawn towards that and people make money off giving us those buttons that get pressed and that's how our world operates the evolution of games and then the internet has been in the direction of hey how can we sell people buttons that they press to get dopamine That's advertising. That's how the internet works at a really foundational level. That's the economy of the internet. It's all about the attention economy. It's the addiction economy. They're giving us things on purpose to try and get us hooked. The book that they all use that tells them how to build apps that keep people's attention is called Hooked. This is the Bible of Silicon Valley. So our world is designed to get us addicted. It gets us addicted by manipulating this fact about the way that our brain deals with dopamine when you have that kind of an environment, 
you're going to have dopamine dysregulation. So we're not capable individually of dealing with this. Our brains haven't evolved anything. So we get too much of that. Our brains will trip over into a dysregulated state where our dopamine basically is behaving in a way that our brain isn't designed to deal with. So we're overloaded with dopamine. We're hunting it too much. Dopamine dysregulation is one of the biggest undercause, like it's one of the biggest pathologies, the, the sort of like the, the biochemistry of ADHD. If you have dopamine dysregulation, you're going to look like you've got ADHD. So there's a lot of people right now who are getting ADHD diagnosis. If you took their smartphones away from them for two weeks, apparently it's two weeks, their ADHD symptoms go away. So there's a bunch of people who have got underlying ADHD that's like developmentally traumatically triggered in early childhood. And that's a really legitimate, difficult experience to have. But that's probably something like up to 20% of the population. At the moment, I consider anyone who's basically a millennial or younger, I think it's probably like 80 to 90% are going to be showing ADHD behavior because we've been functionally induced into this dysregulated dopamine state, which just looks like ADHD. So everyone's going, oh, yeah, I struggle with that. It's good. Yeah, that's because these little asshole engines are manipulating your brain, are triggering you into that. So yes, it's cultural, but I think it's being driven by really deep reasons. It's like culture to hang out in the sunshine. It's driven by the fact that the sun comes out. But we like hanging out in the sunshine. So you end up with cafe culture. So yes, there's a culture, but I think it's being driven by like a really fundamental biochemical fact about how our brains work. So brilliant. That's a very thorough explanation or answer to the, to the question. So given what you just said, are you sort of implying that there's a spectrum of ADHD and every single person sits on that spectrum with a certain sort of susceptibility or predisposition to displaying ADHD type symptoms as a result of their environment. So, uh, so the point I'm trying to make is that someone, person X can tolerate more, I don't know, what's the chemical sort of way of explaining it, has a greater resistance to or maybe what would you say is more sensitive to a dopamine hit and therefore it satiates them better and then person and then person y has less of a sensitivity to, to a dopamine hit and therefore needs a greater stimulus to okay. um evoke that sort of satiating feeling and then is that a biological i suppose it's biological and it's environmental isn't it at the same time and obviously, as you said, we're just breeding a culture of people that are probably going to lean towards person Y as we progress through the technological advances that we're currently on. I'll tell you a little story. I was working the other day and I saw a woman with a baby and um, the baby was looking at her phone and I sort of went over and sort of curious, sort of what what was she, what she looking at? And then she was like, oh, she's looking at TikTok. And I was like, what? She's looking at TikTok. She was like, oh, yeah, it's the only thing that calms her down. I was like, oh dear. And she was, and so, I mean, I was born in 1999. So I grew up with big old Nokia bricks. My parents had like big Nokia bricks as phones. And I, oh, and I, the first ever game console I ever got hold of was an intent. It might have been a Game Boy actually, but I think it was an, an but it was, Game Boy was a, what was it? Is a single axis. Uh, I don't know what the correct gaming terminology is, but you could only go from platform. left to right. Pardon? I think it's called a platform game. I okay, think it's yeah. Platform gaming. Okay, cool. But the the next one was Nintendo DS, and I, I this is etched in my memory. It's the only I watched the gameplay of it a few weeks ago. But I got the Transformers game, and I can remember pressing the first ever button, which made you jump. I can remember jumping. And just watching this little figure on this tiny screen jumping and going, wow, this is amazing. Look at it jump. This is little. And um, and then that's when I was, what, seven or eight, maybe. A child that's born now is exposing, has been exposed to, or is being exposed mm. to, the gimmicks and the, the whizzes and the bells and whistles of modern editing that you get on TikTok and youtube and what is that gonna what will the how will they i can't even comprehend 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I get terrified when I look at when I look at the research. I get utterly terrified. Um, I think we're running a massive experiment on on our brains, on our ability to be human beings. We're creating an environment. I'd say not the same thing. Yeah, and I, I think the environment that we're in is incredibly difficult for human beings to survive. Like, we're, we're not really designed to survive. Like, we haven't evolved to handle the vast amount of information that we deal with, the vast amount of uh, stuff that happens and how fast it happens. So we're all scrambling to catch up. I think one of the reasons why everyone's so tired all the time is because just keeping up, like, let alone thriving, let alone, like, succeeding, let alone getting ahead of the curve, just keeping up, absolutely. You know the pressure; it's enormous. But I want to go back to the the kind of one of the questions you asked is like, you know, is there a spectrum of this? And I think what people often get wrong about ADHD is this idea that it's like a binary thing: you either have it or you don't. So, ADHD is don't engage in any behaviors that is different from normal people. So, the way that I describe this is like, okay, like how many times a day do you go to the loo? Right? Maybe you drink a lot of water. You go a few times a day. If you went 50 times a day, you'd be like, okay, that's a bit of a problem, right? That's getting in the way of your life. Yeah. ADHD is a bit like that. It's not doing something unusual. You know, everyone struggles with making decisions. Everyone struggles with overwhelm. Everyone struggles with energy. But if you're struggling 5% of the time, you're gonna, that's, that's a neurotypical brain. If you're struggling 50% of the time, that's a very different lived experience and it's going to really get in the way of you coping with life. That's an ADHD experience. So I can bang on about, if you want me to, I can bang on about some of the neurology behind all this. But there's basically bits of the brain that are responsible for doing certain kind of very human... Uh, careful, I will. Cool. Well, I'll, right. I'll, I'll, I'll put my away. hand up at a point yeah. and I'm like, right, let's let's uh, move on. No, all right, I'll do the, I'll do the swift version I can. So... At the base of your brain, there's uh, a couple of organs that we just need to call out a name. There's the base of ganglia. And the base of ganglia is actually a bunch of little sort of organelles, little bits of brain matter that are kind of structured and have, have like, they kind of look like a thing. And there's a little cluster of them at the bottom in the middle. And just behind that, underneath the back of the brain, is another sort of what we call mini brain, cerebellum. Yes. Now, the that. first bit there, the base of ganglia, you know, do you know, do you know your computers really well, like um, your graphics processing unit on a computer. Which no, I'm, I'm not a computer guy. I know, like, ah, uh, this would have been a really good... do it anyway, and okay. maybe I yeah, just anyway. Say it anyway. Just, just like, so in a computer, you have a CPU that is your I know that you know your processing unit. It does the thinking for your computer, right? But there's some stuff that you can do faster if you have a dedicated processor to do it. So GPUs were invented. And GPUs, they're graphical processing unit, but they they do graphics because they crunch the numbers that underpin like doing graphical presentation. So historically, it's called a GPU. But what it basically is, it's a number cruncher. It just crunches raw maths really fast. And technically, there's matrix holder really fast. But the point of that is that it's hyper-specialized to do just that. So it takes complex mass and just churns out answers. Okay. And it does that way better than the CPU. It's less energy intensive and it's faster. But between the CPU and the GPU lives a little controller that kind of decides when or contributes to the decision process of when to trigger the GPU and when to do something. So your brain's a little bit like that. Your cerebellum at the back here has 80% of the neurons of your brain in it, even though it's smaller than the rest of the brain. They're really dense and they're hyper-connected. And basically what the cerebellum does is it takes sort of chaotic, complex patterns. So your brain's not crunching numbers, it's crunching patterns. So the cerebellum takes a bunch of complex patterns in and it kind of crunches them and comes out with a smooth output pattern that it sends back to the rest of the brain that kind of regulates the rest of the brain and kind of like triggers it to then like it's the output the base of ganglia we didn't think these were connected for ages but the recent neuroscience shows that they're pretty connected and they work in tandem where the base of ganglia kind of decides when to trigger the cerebellum and what patterns you know what patterns cause the triggering and like how to use the cerebellum to map it to the input so when you get a piece of input in like a social experience 
when you're a teenager, your brain basically works out, oh, this is really complicated because social stuff is super, super complicated. But it works out, oh, people respond like this. I can see a pattern. The basal ganglia kind of learns that. And then the cerebellum crunches it, which means that you go, oh, in this situation, I respond like this. Or my classic example of playing tennis with Roger Federer. Roger Federer is training his cerebellum to enact this particular motion when the ball comes at me at that angle. So the basal ganglia is like learning what all those inputs are, but the cerebellum is doing the hard work of actually crunching stuff. Right. So when either of those two get messy, you end up with neurodiversity. The basal ganglia is massively influenced by dopamine. It gets swamped by it. And if you don't have it, it, doesn't, it can't do its work. So that peeing 50 times a day ADHD experience if the basal ganglia can't work out when to trigger the cerebellum to say, hey, this is the action we should do now, then there's no autopilot, which means that you have to spend the CPU energy of the rest of your brain working out what to do in life, which means you have to think about it, and that's slower and more energy intensive. That's draining. It's harder to work out what to do because actually life is complicated. It's not always obvious what to do. Most brains spend most of their time trying to work out What's the shortest, easiest response to the thing happening right now that means I use the least amount of energy? That's actually how we live most of the time. If that isn't working, that's where the ADHD kicks in. You start having people going, I just don't know what to choose. I'm overwhelmed by the options. I should do this, I should do that, but I can't get going. That I can't get going is the basal ganglia going, I don't know what to tell the cerebellum to crunch. And then the cerebellum doesn't tell the rest of the brain, hey, here's your operating principle, go do this now. Did that make enough sense? That did make sometimes sense. I explain this really articulately, and sometimes I get into the weeds, and it all sounds really like what? That's all right. I understand. I understand the, the cerebellum bit, but what is the does, is the basal ganglia precede the cerebellum in the sort of chain of events? So the message is sent to the basal ganglia. Do we respond with the basal ganglia, and then the cerebellum sort of kicks in, sort of in the same way that like uh, cachet or it's like the storage system of the brain. Is that not quite It's, right? it's more like the processing unit. It the does the work. Is, so yeah, you did say like that. you save scripts. If you imagine that you save like scripts or pre-coded, like you do your teeth, right? You wake up, you do your teeth. If you don't think about that, that's because the you wake up, you're basically going to go, hey, I recognize this moment in time. Hey, cerebellum, kick off the doing our teeth routine. And the cerebellum goes, ah, and just kicks it off, right? And you just find yourself doing your teeth. And then you finish doing your teeth or you hop in the shower and you get out and go, I can't remember. Have I had a shower? Have I done my teeth? You didn't even think about it, right? It just happened on autopilot. Oh, That's okay. your cerebellum doing lots of work, okay. right? And the cerebellum does a hell of a lot of that, right? It, it automates literally your physical motion and, and the routines and all that stuff. Now, people with ADHD or neurodiversity often have to be like, I have to go do my teeth. I need to walk to the thing. Okay, I'm going to put the toothpaste on there. They have to walk themselves through it by telling themselves they can't do it on autopilot you know they can't remember which sock drawer their socks are in you know these basic things the cerebellum is the part of the brain that should be doing that and just going ah this is such a common process let's just do it so in adhd is if that basal ganglia isn't working properly it doesn't trigger the cerebellum so there's a little bit of evidence that would suggest that disruption to the basal ganglia is more commonly associated with the label adhd and disruptions to the cerebellum or differently functioning cerebellum is okay. more commonly associated with the autism label. Yeah. So, but there's so much research here. Uh, I, anything I say, someone will come back at me and go, that's not technically correct. Yeah. It's like, yes. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. There's, there's, this is like the best understanding I've got on it. So the cerebellum is a bit more like autism and the face scan is a little bit more ADHD, or at least we label those. But actually the truth is, it's not so much cause and effect. It's it's like, you know, if you fumble a play in football, whose fault is it? Sometimes it's no one's fault. It's just the way the team played together just didn't quite land. It's the way that they work together. So the basic game of the server work together to do this stuff. And when they work together well, their impact on the rest of the brain is that it can take pressure off and it can do things faster and more efficiently. If for any reason they're not working together, the end result of their collaboration doesn't get provided to the rest of the brain. The rest of the brain doesn't have that information to work with and has to do it another way and, and, and does it like, you know, raw, works it out. 
I get you. Okay. Okay. So, so sort of going back to the, the way in which dopamine relates to what you just said, people often think that dopamine is solely a reward, uh, neuro, a re- reward hormone, but it also strengthens patterns, doesn't it? So it isn't just that it makes you, it isn't just that you get a hit of dopamine when something happens. It also strengthens whatever action or behavior it was that created that sensation. So it's sort of like your, yeah. I don't have any more than two hands, but you're like building this sort of thing growing out. And and I understand what you mean though. So if the basal ganglia is not working, then uh, f- not properly functioning, then is it that, I mean, we we will move on from this topic, but is it that people with ADHD, they don't have that sort of storage of, they don't, there's not like a network. So they don't, they're not able to go, I need to stop doing this now, or I need to, do this or i need to focus on yeah, that it's sort of like anything that involves like routine and triggering uh kind of like a script it it's you know it becomes harder to identify when a script is possible it becomes harder to execute a script that you have previously seen um it becomes i mean they're kind of the main ones aren't they uh you even if you identify the script you you can struggle to store it so wow. I mean, you're right about the fact that reward isn't the main thing that dopamine. Dopamine is basically about pattern recognition. Yeah. So it will spike when you, it will spike when you perceive that there might be a pattern that you recognize about to happen. So you're coming up towards, or like you hear a, you know, Pavlov's dogs. You know, you hear a bell, and you think there's going to be some food. You hear the bell. Dopamine spikes in anticipation that there's going to be a pattern played out. That pattern playing out is, in this case, a reward. And then if it happens, you get another dopamine spike to say, yeah, lock that one in. So that's the basic gang to kind of learn. Like, yep, yep, this is a good pattern. The response that you enact is more likely going to be in the cerebellum and stuff. The the the, the kind of break there, if the um, basic gang isn't working, I, like it could sort of happen anywhere. Like the basic gang, it could be doing its job just fine, but can't get its message over to the cerebellum. So I don't want to say that that it's like ADHD is the basal ganglia doing that. When the basal ganglia isn't doing its job for whatever reason, you know, and it couldn't, it might not be dopamine, it could be brain injury. Like, you know, there's this correlation between just literally having brain injury and appearing to be ADHD. ADHD is a behavioral label for a cluster of symptoms. So what's going on in the brain, you can end up with those um disruptions or the the consequence of disruption is that this whole system doesn't do its job at the end result and then you're going to look like you've got adhd but exactly which part of the system or which part of the workflow failed like there are multiple different ways of triggering this there's lots of different scenarios there's some common ones there's some well-known ones but adhd is the label for the consequence rather than the thing so it would be unwise to tie them together too directly. Yes, but they are. Yeah, they, they belong to each other when we speak about it. Mm-hmm. No, I, I understand that the, um, yeah, the uh, the front work or the the forward, so to speak, is possibly a result of a myriad of different things. So I understand what that means. We haven't even talked about the prefrontal cortex, which is massive for people with ADHD, and like that's a different part of the brain doing its own thing highly correlated with adhd and we haven't even mentioned it we'll get on to that in a minute Let, i just want to run a little sort of question such idea that i have by you is um adhd correlated with sort of extroversion and introversion do they is there anyone that has done any research into that if you off if you the top know. of my head i don't have an immediate answer but i do have something that i do think about a lot around this which is that i think that adhd is a profoundly tribal creatures so I have this little theory, and there's a little bit of stuff out there that kind of backs this, which is that I think ADHD is like the OG version of humans, like the hunter-gatherer version of humans. It's actually really good for hunter-gatherers. Hunter-gatherers with ADHD symptoms actually feed themselves better than the neurotypicals. The problem, I think, turned up when we got farming, because farming requires you to not move on, but to grind a particular thing day in, day out, over long periods of time that's like a really good fit for neurotypicals so i wonder my little thesis is that i wonder if neuro what we call neurotypicality is actually like farming neurology and adhd is like the og hunter-gatherer neurology 
So we trip into ADHD really easily because, well, that's actually where we come from. So neurotypicality might be the hard thing to achieve, that circumstances have to be just right for the brain to be able to work like a neurotypical, because actually it's the most recently evolved state that the brain can be in and therefore is like more fragile. Whereas ADHD is an easier fallback because we've been in ADHD land for you know, maybe hundreds of thousands of years longer. This is a theory. I'm like, there's a little bit of evidence out there. That like, oh, this could be interesting. But I'm like, how interesting is that, right? That, that kind of makes sense in some ways because we're tribal creatures. He, one of the things that I say to my clients in the therapy is you've got to get yourself a, a, a support group because historically, I think ADHD is regulated in tribe. So when you have a tribe, you have rituals and routines and ways of behaving that is stored in the tribe itself, right? Everyone does, it's how things work, you know? Like if you were living in a little village, you'd have your fairs at certain times of year. It's just known that that's what happened. Only one person has to remember it for that to effectively come to pass. So if you live in that kind of environment as a human being, you can really rely on those external triggers, those external routines to do a lot of regulation for you. You just need to go with the flow. You don't have to do it yourself. Whereas right now, we mostly live in isolation. You know, we live in our own houses, our own flats, our own rooms, and we spend a lot of time on our own phones in our own kind of like little entertainment complexes we build ourselves. And we're spending less and less time with other people in real life. I wonder whether one of the reasons why ADHD is, you know, becoming more profound as well is that people are having less and less external regulation so the things that might historically have mitigated the kind of difficult expressions of ADHD, you know, they're going to the toilet 50 times a day as opposed to, you know, 15, which is still a lot, but not like not 50. So if that's true and we are designed or need other people to help us regulate, which is actually a big part of what Micropilot AI is all about. If that's true, then that kind of implies that we are probably quite extroverted in the sense that we need external energy to help us kind of like be motivated. Like I know for a fact when I work, I work really well when I'm working with someone else and I find it really difficult to get shit done when I'm by myself. But at the same time, I'm a raging introvert. So our ADHD is maybe ambiverts that we need energy externally in a certain way, but we also need to recharge. Also, there's a big overlap between autism and ADHD. Didn't used to think that was the case, but this the evidence is beginning to show that they're quite related. Um, autism does lean towards introversion, I think. There's some evidence to suggest that we need a lot of time to recharge. We need time to like allow our nervous systems to regulate when other people bring us up. I mean, I think behind all of this is, is the question of regulation. You know, we Absolutely. talk about things like trauma. We talk about things like... I think that the way things are moving, the big word that's going to replace trauma in the therapy world is going to be regulation, where we're just like, hey, our vagus nerves are completely out of whack. Our biochemistry is out of whack. Our dopamine is out of whack. How do we get into a place of regulation? And I think balancing time to yourself to allow yourself to discharge energy and just relax balances needing to go and hang out with other people who wind us up and give us energy to achieve things. So I, I don't know. I wonder, I'm kind of like playing out loud with this because I don't know how to make the words extroversion and introversion land well with this. They might not be the right words or they might be a bit of both. It's a good question. Though. Well, the, the, only reason I, the only reason I ask it is because maybe it's, maybe it's more, I definitely think extroversion, introversion is relevant to like something like addiction because and uh because i think we know that extrovert people have a proclivity towards hedonism more than introverted people and there's probably quite a few reasons for that one is because they're more interested in social gatherings and engagements and quite often that's where sort of hedonistic uh occurrences take place and the other is the reason why i relate it to dopamine is because i think extrovert people require more of an intense hit of dopamine to feel satiated than introverted people do so I, i'd consider myself it's it, I, that might be wrong but i'm just gonna keep going so i'd that's consider myself yeah i mean you know maybe that's sort of uh, a part and parcel statement of what i'm saying it's i haven't thought too much into it but i would consider myself a pretty introverted person or at least sort of ambiverted or 
when I need to be extroverted, I have to sort of click on and I need to have my social battery, which is, I mean, that's very common, I think. Some people you meet and they're like, non, they're all the go, nonstop, and it's intense. And me being a very introspective sort of, uh, what would you say, uh, feeding off other people's energy maybe energy energy is a bit woo woo but just what they are i can feel quite drained when i spend to when i spend time with an extremely extrovert person but oh i've gone i've done a sidestep now what was i saying um yeah so so when i i i'm very sent as consider myself relatively introverted i would consider myself someone who feels quite almost i was thinking about this the other day psychologically or maybe hormonally bloated quite quickly so if I've eaten a load of junk food or I don't drink alcohol but occasionally if I get quite drunk I it really impacts me and I'm like I I feel I think part of it is I'm also a very orderly person which is related to sort of disgust sensitivity so there's there's that going on as well but I tend to feel like I've indulged too much I need to sort of take a break and um recoup before I go back to sort of searching I guess dopamine hits to use a sort of facile terminology in this context Mm -hmm. whereas I think other people aren't quite as like that they can drink night after night they can party they don't and that's the only reason why I bring up the whole introversion extroversion thing because I just wonder if introverted people are slightly more introspective and therefore that means maybe it's even just a completely psychological thing there's no there's no hormonal things they're more introspective and therefore they're less like they're more likely to contemplate their actions which therefore uh leads them down maybe routes that i don't know to be fair thinking about what i've just said it's it's more relevant to addiction than it is to like adhd and uh, neurodivergence to be fair but um... again so much of the labels you know we can get really hung up on trying to define specific labels when it makes more sense i think to kind of treat them as their fuzzy word cloud definitions you know they're literally just word right we use them to communicate with other human beings and say hey you know when i say introversion it's like in your brain, there's a bunch of associations that spin up. You're like, okay, I kind of know what you're talking about. But the details only matter in context of the conversation. Like, why do you care about introversion in that conversation? So it's a shorthand for saying, hey, you know that stuff? Hand wave over there, right? But then when we try and define them really precisely, we tend to get into a bit of a problem. It's like, well, what do we really mean? You know, define your terms and all that stuff. And I think, I think there's value in allowing a word to be loose and fuzzy because what we're trying to achieve like some people are trying to do research and really land stuff it's like cool make you know define your terms be really precise because you're doing science but for most of us we're trying to come up with stories that help us live right that's what we care about (laughs) we don't actually care about you know the specific science behind it we just care what's the impact of that science on me how does this help me live how does this help me cope so we use words like introversion extroversion to make sense of how we respond but we can get really stuck and go, yeah, but hold on, I'm like I'm extrovert over here and I'm introvert over here. One of the biggest things in the psychotherapy that I do is I you know, people turn up in psychotherapy with a fundamental question, which is often, who am I? You know, they're struggling with things like I ah, you know, I'm being hit by all this stuff and in amongst all this life experience, who am I? And I don't think there's an answer to that because I don't think human beings are single um entities. I think our brains are Super complex thing, lots of different contributory parts. We're like a committee or a vote or a constellation of, we're like an internal tribe, you know, like a like an ant heap made up of lots of little parts. If we think about ourselves like that and allow and, and, and recognize, you know, even a, a basic sort of, you know, the brain is a, a neural net, right? So it has activation states. The same hardware can be activated in different ways that then behaves differently. So you can be a totally different personality two hours apart, right? They're both you. 
You know, are you the person who's really extrovert and needs other people for energy? Or are you the person who really just wants other people to piss off because you need downtime and God, they're so annoying. You're both. And they, they, they both turn up at different times. We get really hung up on like which one I am. Human beings are capable of extroversion. Human beings are capable of introversion. Some of us are a bit more biased towards one. We use them in different contexts. I think giving ourselves permission to be really much more fluid in who we are and be like, let's be curious. It's like, oh, I really noticed that I love being an extrovert. I also noticed that I get really drained on that. I also noticed that if I don't do it, I get really drained. So I do a lot of business networking. I love it. it. It's like high energy. Sometimes I can't and I have to just leave because I'm like, do not have the spoons for this today. Goodbye. Sometimes I get too drunk and I'm like, oh no, I so regret what I did last night. That, oh, you know, shit. Because, you know, I've got ADHD. If I start drinking, I can go down the rabbit hole on that. On other days, it recharges me and it keeps me infused for the next few weeks of work where I'm like, yeah, that was so awesome. Yeah, I've got great motivation. I get shit done. Sometimes I go and I walk away and go, what am I doing? You know, what am I doing? Like, none of that worked. I just got battered by people's psyches that night. You know, it's different every time. I think we get too hung up on like which label I am. We have fuzzy homes where we often sit at certain times. Like when I'm at home, I'm an introvert. <laughs> when I'm at the pub, I'm more of an extrovert. Yeah. yeah funny that. I, some people, I think you're right. Some people really live in one or the other. But I think when you said like other people are like at the pub and they just go out and drinking night after night, I think you would be really surprised if you did a, a study on those people, how many of them are actually doing that and how many of them are turning up and showing that side of themselves. Because the reality is a very small percentage of the population actually do that and can live that. Yeah. No. And that's cool. Like there's a small percentage that do that. There's a small percentage of people who don't go out at all and are raging introverts and live completely in, you know, computer games or whatever. Um most of us are a bit of a complex, messy, <laughs> you know, yeah. dice roll of it. It's like, I don't know, like you know, on Thursday, am I going to have loads of energy or am I going to have no energy? I don't know until Thursday turns up. This is very true. I think that's a really common experience for most people. Yeah. We're making up as we go along. We are. We, we really are. And it, and um, I had this woman on my podcast a few, no, it was about a year, maybe it was even a year ago, uh, who wrote a book called Why Prioritizing Motherhood in the First Three Years of life is integral and she was basically talking yeah. about the necessity for women to because she was delineating how i think i saw a stat on the tv the other day that children or young infants need emotional regulation something like once every 30 seconds at least so i have basically, a theory yeah what was that basically basically 24 7 basically 24 7 yeah okay. So I, I have a theory that many of us are born with a sort of predisposition to some form of psychopathology that we that exists sort of on the precipice depending on how our life goes about. And I think that historically what the role of the mother what they still do and the, and the father in other ways but it's becoming less and less because of the way that our society is set up is that women regulated or mums regulated their children's emotions to a certain point so that they you just you said there we're like an inner tribe so what they were doing is they were helping us put all our mini personalities and integrating them into ourselves i think this is you should you would love him i i don't know a lot about him, but there's a there was a developmental psychologist called piaget who was a who was absolute genius yeah. And the, yeah, what was I saying? The, yeah, so the integrating the different aspects of our society, oh, not society, well, society, yeah, but into the Freudian slip, but integrating yeah, the, same thing of yeah, exactly, yeah. Integrating the different aspects of our personality is absolutely integral. And I do think that part of the reason why so many people are struggling, why there is ADHD is getting more diagnosed, why autism is being more diagnosed, why anxiety is on the rise, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is because children were not. This generation of young people were not effectively 
didn't he grow up in an environment that was conducive to the effective integration of these yeah. aspects of I their would. personality and therefore all these problems are occurring yeah i would agree with the the insight that our environment and our culture leads towards essentially psychological fracturing and good word yeah good there's there's a there's a, a, a metaphor that we use in therapy um, that is based on the idea that you start as like a whole, like a soul, a beautiful, radiant soul, and then as traumas happen, you switch bits of yourself off and you hide yourself, and that creates a factory. I actually disagree with that. I think that we start as multiple potentials, like we're actually like this loose constellation of like possibilities and, and, and human abilities, and we coalesce. And when we are well held in childhood, we coalesce towards what we experience as humans, well-rounded human beings. The experience of being human is a taught, learned, culturally passed on experience. Where I would slightly disagree on you know, why that has come to pass, I think we can put way too much blame on mums. So mums historically are, yeah, they're the primary caregiver and there is a special relationship there. But two things. One, there's a really fascinating bit of research, and I'm I, I suck at remembering names and like references, but it's out there and it's Googleable. Uh, an anthropologist tried to find out what is it that makes a good mother, and studied all the mothers in the world that she could to try and find common themes to be like right. What what underpins good mother? She found that there is only one thing that all mothers share in common in all cultures: they feed their kids. There is nothing else that is in common in motherhood. I think we put way too much pressure on women psychologically to be perfect mothers. Also, given the fact, going back to this tribal thing, human beings are not designed to live in isolation. A mum raising a child in isolation is at extreme risk of um, having like fracture and meltdown because she's not being regulated. It takes a village to raise a child, famous proverb. And I think that's so true. So the reason that we're dysregulating is because I, I, th I think more fundamentally is we live in a world where we may not live next to our parents anymore. You know, we raise our kids in a completely different city or town. We don't come from places. We're not rooted and grounded in our village. And that's fine because we're moving for economic reasons. It makes sense in the modern world. But it is the case. We also live in an industrial era and in a capitalist era. I could bang on about how both of those influence this and fracture tribes and communities to try and isolate people not necessarily like insidiously on purpose but it's system systematically or systemically the case so i think the fundamental problem we've got is that we are not and then you can go back to agriculture and say you know that also changed things and there's lots of interesting uh stuff about like agriculture and the male psyche in particular you know what's it like to have a testosterone filled brain when you control a bit of land, what are the consequences of that? Yeah, I could bang on about the interesting consequences of that for like marriage and stuff. So I think there's a lot of evolution. What are the interesting consequences of that? Uh, that's like a whole other conversation. Oh. <laughs> okay, next one. Um, and and in fairness, on that one, I'm. That's more speculative theory. I think there's far less we can say i think if we're talking about things like adhd and if i'm rooting myself again like i try and find narratives that have good backing in multiple different ways of looking at the world yeah and i have some stuff about, like i'm very interested in masculinity and femininity and i think a lot of the conversations i hear from all angles i'm like i don't buy any of this i think i think almost everyone's missing the mark but how much do we really know about how do we like there's so little that we know about this i think if you really look at anthropological research if you also look at people who are transgender and experience things on both sides and have literally experienced what it's like to have an estrogen filled brain and a testosterone filled brain like we should be just be listening to all of these experiences and reading what that's so i think too many people jump in with opinions too fast i look at this stuff and i'm like wow messy and complicated but i think that that's my take home right is that hey it's messy and complicated Let's stop jumping on these labels and really shoehorning people into these labels. We need to stay messy and complicated because that's the human experience. And that's what kids are missing. 
they are locked in little worlds in flats with one caregiver for periods of time. They're not allowed to go outside. They don't get the mess of the world. And that leaves us kind of going, well, you know, what what is the world? There's a there's a really fascinating um bit of um psychology uh coming from the neuroscience where there's like a loop of how the brain basically works with the world. It takes in information, it it processes it for salience to work out what it needs to care about. So it actually discards most of the information coming in. That's why you get tired at the end of a busy day where you've done lots of different things, because your brain's actually too, using huge amounts of energy to throw information away. When you decide on the information that you want to pick, you work out like a mental model of what that means. Then you come up with a, a, a theory of action and then you kind of um, execute that and then you see what the result is. So there's this loop. And and this is all like spontaneous and it happens among different organelles in the brain. So you can kind of see it shoot around in the brain and do its thing. If you give people computer games, teenagers with computer games, they do the first half of the process and then they just shortcut. Because computer games are gameable. Like you can literally learn this trigger response to that behavior. And good computer game, you know, good gamers, that's what they do. They see the in input and they just act the thumb press motion that executes that particular action that kills that baddie. They don't have to come up with complex mental models. They only have to work out what the rules of that game are. And any game is super simple in comparison to the complexity of the real world so yeah. these kids are not learning how to do chaos worlds and they're going to you know literally like the people on checkouts at the supermarket going this is too complex because human interactions human to human relationships are beyond complicated which is why people with autism struggle with them because cerebellums going back to that do most of our social it doesn't processes. automate for them so it automates differently. So people with autism, there seems to be a clear difference in things like the Purkinje cells in the cerebellum. And I'm, I'm just name dropping that word to be like, yes, I know what I'm talking about. This stuff, and I actually could do with being a bit more precise on what this is. But there are structural differences that are perceivable. And this is very fresh. This is like 10 years old research only. Yeah. So we know, So given, all right, this is the way I see this. Given that the cerebellum does most of our social processing and we see differences in behavior there for autism, and then we go back to my little theory about how, or the theory, um, how the basic ganglia of the cerebellum kind of automates stuff for the rest of the brain. And when that doesn't work, the rest of the brain has to do it manually in the slow way, right? People with autism often experience social situations in overwhelm because they don't know what the manual is. They don't know what the right response is. Yeah. And they have to work it out in real time, which is slow and draining. Yes. The manual is the cerebellum that most teenagers, neurotypical teenagers, teach during teenage years and just encode patterns. So the manual is they just literally watched other people and went, I'll do what they did. And they copy. And the cerebellum copies those patterns and goes, oh, that's good enough. Because good enough is good enough for the cerebellum. Yeah. Whereas someone with autism whose cerebellum does not function like that can't train the cerebellum to do that because the cerebellum there is doing other stuff, looking at other types of patterns, it's just missing the social. Then they're, you know, mid 20s and early 30s in a pub and something happens and they are trying to process in real time using the slow CPU of the neocortex going, ah, I don't know what to respond because I can see like 20 different layers of interaction happening here. Body language is telling me this. They said that. Their tone of voice said this, but they used that word. And that word means like one of these three things. And they perceive all of this simultaneously and end up with a list of things. Like I could respond from any of these and I have no bias to picking one. If the cerebellum was working neurotypically, it would just take those 20 inputs and go, oh, in this case, we go with that one bang do that one it, yeah. it doesn't think it through it just goes oh this complex chaotic mess of input my job is to crunch that down and give a single answer that's the cerebellum's job if it's not doing that you end up with the input going well, how do i decide and that's the experience of autism for a lot of people so i think that's a really compelling sort of neuroscientific narrative of maybe what's going on for people with autism and i can't actually remember why we brought that one up but that's fine um 
because I was I went on some slew about something. Uh, yeah, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, what other what other are there any potential benefits to having a brain that functions like that that doesn't immediately reduce things to a pre stored um yeah sort of narrative yes. or structure and so the the reality is that if you don't run with the good enough answer and you have time to come up with a better answer your cpu the neocortex is ultimately more intelligent so I would posit, I think every genius ever has been neurodiverse because it takes the 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 automatic good enough processing not to work for them to go, well, shit, I've got to do this manually now. But if you do it manually, your capacity to become absolutely excellent at it is increased because you, 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 you know, like where, where, where's the point of good enough? You don't know. So you just keep going and you keep going and you keep going and you become better and better and better. So I suspect I suspect that if we were to analyze genius, it would have a high, if not perfect, correlation with neurodiversity. I'd also go um, one step further and say, I, I often think of like human, the species evolution as like an amoeba. If we could kind of like put everyone in a place, but like some coherent structure, the shape of an amoeba makes a lot of sense. And most people want to be in the middle of the amoeba. Like, we just want to be in the middle. We just want to be accepted. So most people just, they just work out, common, this is what common sense is. How do I just stay in my tribe without stressing anything? I just want to belong. I just want to get through the day with my brain using the minimum amount of energy, and I just want to have fun. I just want an easy life, right? The best way of doing that, the best strategy is to go, where's the center of everything culturally and you know, species wise, and I'll just, I'll just go there. Right. And that makes a lot of sense, but you need people at the edge of them. People going, Hey guys, there's food over here. If we go in this direction, we would have better existence, but you're going to have people who are at both ends going, yeah, but it was also, we had food back there. It was better back there. And you've got people at the front edge going, yeah, but there's new food over here. And, but it's always changing. Like there might be good food over there. There might be good food over there. There's no absolute answer to where the better food is. It's an amoeba in a chaotic world. It's just moving around, hunting and going, ah, I don't know. And when one of these edges finds something, goes, guys, guys, mad good food over here. The center of the amoeba goes, oh, we'll just slowly, slowly go over there because that kind of makes sense. But it, and, and so the whole thing moves. If you didn't have people going towards the center, mostly the whole thing would fall apart your species would disintegrate. There wouldn't be any coherence to it. So from an evolutionary perspective, it makes the most sense for the most people to try and be more or less average and for some people to be on the edge. But you don't want everyone on the edge because your species will just disintegrate. You just want enough people on the edge. So the evolutionary pressure to keep some kind of balance here makes a lot of sense. And in times of great uncertainty and great change, it kind of makes sense from an evolutionary perspective that more people get pushed to the edge because when things are really bad and really stressed, you want to be hunting for new food. You want to be moving. You don't want to be staying where you are. So I think there's a sort of natural evolutionary pressure. I, I, you know, I mean, to me, this is what I studied. The, the, the mindset here makes total sense to me, but I get that these metaphors are like, if you don't think about evolution and don't understand the maths of it, sometimes these metaphors don't make too much sense. But I, yeah, no, I, I, I love this. There's, like, there's a so that, that literally that sort of concept that you described out there is, I think you said it earlier. I've forgotten what the word is, but you reminded me. It's 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 fractally dense in the sense of that phenomenon sort of exists on so many different levels of our existence. So it's it's political, evidently, interpersonal, Political, cultural, species level. Evolution L applies at all layers. Literally, there's, there's, so there's a thing with... Um, I saw a video a while ago. This guy was talking about how zebras camouflage themselves. So people say zebras are camouflaged. And then you go, well, they're black and white, so they're not camouflaged, are they? Because they live in the Sahara and everything's flipping dusty and, and goldy and brown. And then, but what they mean is they're camouflaged against one another. So apparently, this is what I've heard, but this it makes complete sense to be fair. But these photographers were trying to take photos, or these, and whatever the word is, zoologists were trying to study specific zebras. So they would like mark them in some way. So they'd put like a 
a mark on their haunch thing they'd tag them maybe and what they because what they were trying to do is they were trying to study one zebra so they look down to do something and then they look up and they go oh dear we've lost the zebra so we've got to mark these guys what they found was that these zebras kept on getting eaten by the lions and the the, the point was is people think that nature is cruel in the sense of lions target the weak and the vulnerable but it isn't quite that they tar- or predators target the weak and the vulnerable isn't quite that they target the weak and the vulnerable it's not quite the right wording what they do is they just look for the 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 ones that stand out the most noteworthy ones because they're the ones that they can i mean obviously this might not be true but it's a possible it's theory it's, but they pick off what they can with the least amount of energy exactly they they they, they get the ones who and they can to correlate with the ones that can't run can't jump and you know absolutely so, yeah they end up the zebra thing, by the way, um, you, there's new research out on that one that shows that um, so this is, I don't know, this is going like in the last 10 years or so. Um, zebra camouflage is particularly good at uh, discombobulating the tipsy fly, which is a real pet. So some, some uh, zoologists would argue that actually the stronger pressure for the uh, stripes is to... Is, is for the flies but if you've got pressure for flies and also it helps you evade lions it's like yeah let's let's evolve in this direction guys you know it's like finding pressure there's often life isn't a single cause it's again this messy complex there's pressures and when they all point in the same direction you end up flowing in that direction so yeah i think there's a lot of stuff like that where what's actually the case is often the case because of this sort of like huh really reasons you know when you find out why you're like oh really that kind of makes sense but i wouldn't have thought of that there's like a pressure and they they add up together and that for me that's the pressure on the amoeba and the and that motion I, I think neurodiversity and the difference between neurodiversity and neurotypicality is um you know those questions and that way of asking the question you know what are the pressures what makes sense here i think that's the most rich vein of questioning that that we can have on it rather than like what does this label you know what's the precise definition of this label it's like how does this serve how does this function how has this come to be you know anthropologically over a long time with lots of people and survival and energy low energy how, how, how are you getting through life with the least amount of energy expenditure tends to be a question to ask every biological creature because that's what we do and, and, and if it, you've got a narrative that makes sense from that that's compelling. Yeah, and it, and it sort of opens up the, the zebra world. Have to run. What's that? The zebra has to run. It doesn't have to run so much. It's lower energy. Yes, exactly. It's all it's all about conservation, isn't it? Which which is I was thinking about the other day. Um, I read a comment, and this guy said, "This the comment said every and go sort of." I don't like to talk about politics too much, but it it made me think, and I was like, oh, that's that's a good idea, actually. Maybe that's the case. It said every uh, liberal is just a conservative in disguise or something, and it was sort of on like this sort of media platform that's quite far left, and I thought, well, that's not true. And then I thought, actually, evolutionary, we're conservatory creatures because if we're not conservative enough, we may die. So we should, in theory... So we may have a I mean. yes, exactly. So we we may maybe we do have a tendency to exist on the conservative side naturally, and therefore, if you did have a bias towards that at population levels, your population would disintegrate completely. Yeah, but exactly. but to then to then come with a, a value judgment about that and say, oh, people at the edge are stupid or foolish. Or no. people who are going to the centre are stupid, foolish. You got a problem, and and I mean, I I love politics. I listen to it daily. I'm extremely into it, and I noticed you got a lot of Jordan Peterson up on your previous videos as well. There's a whole conversation there that could be. I did. Well. I can imagine you're not too. Keen I think there's him. a lot of really good stuff in the world at the moment where, you know, we've got lots of information available to us, and the reality. So, again, neurodiversity, kind of trying to stay with that theme. If you have to process things consciously versus a good enough approach, 
I think that's a really interesting split because, you know, take something political like the riots we've had in the UK recently. Yeah. How much of that is both in the cause and the response to it is about people trying to be in the centre mass and how much of it is them being at the edges and wanting to push things and how much of that is because they are able to have a good enough response and how much of it is because they are unable to have a good enough response. And mm -hmm. those two fit together differently for all humans involved in this, whether they're in the rioting, in the responding to the rioting, or just witnessing. Whether you agree with it or disagree with it, that spectrum of do I have a good enough response versus am I having to think about this consciously, you're going to have very different answers from all these people. So you get a massive spread of of potential um, like relationships that human beings have with all of these events. And when there's big events and messiness and lots of things changing and things scary you're going to get really strong polarization between people who have a good enough approach and people who are thinking about it because the good enough approach is just trying to work out the center ground good enough approach and that's going to have a different answer yeah. for the people who are responding and going I, I whether i like it or not i have to think this through and, you, yeah. and then if you're thinking it through you're going to think through it in multiple different directions depending on because the reality is that sarah Burnham does a good enough job for most people's lives 99.9% .9 of stuff, right? Your heart keeps beating. You're able to walk. The number of people, cerebellums, that really don't function, you know, to the point that they have to be fed by other people is very low. So when we talk about cerebellar dysfunction or dysregulation in the basal ganglia, we are talking fine degrees of variation in the overall system that is a human being. We notice the big differences because we live as human beings in that world of perception. But actually, the differences are quite small in terms of like, you know, it, you're still peeing. Just one of you is peeing 50 times a day and not five. Yeah. But it's still basically yeah. the stuff. So most cerebellums are actually mostly quite good at doing what they need to do. So you get variations. And some people are way on the edge in different directions. And that's exactly as it should be. <laughs> because there isn't an answer to the world. Because the world context changes all the time. Which means that this whole amoeba is constantly needing to reshift and rejigger. And at any given moment an objective alien observer coming along and going, wow, let's analyze this. It's going to be a different assessment of how effective that amoeba on mass is at dealing with the current environment. I don't think there's any given answers. Yeah. I have my preferences. I, I have places where I'm like, I find myself naturally at home in this part of the political yeah, space. Yeah, sure, cool. Well, maybe... But that's just my personal preferences. Yeah, maybe the more people there, there are at either ends of the spectrum the more is indicative of how destabilized the center center is because people are finding they're being polarized to go one way because the middle is no longer the safe space that it once was and that could possibly yeah. lead to some form of collapse if it's pushed exactly and especially if 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 where the amoeba if the amoeba has been happily living in a certain place for ages and runs out of food where yeah. does it go yeah Every edge is going to have its opinion mm. and it's going to put a lot of pressure on that middle bit that doesn't want to be pressurized. So the, you know, the world we live in has um, forces and changes that are unprecedented in human history. Our brains do not know how to deal with yeah. this. I'm not at all surprised to see intense polarization politically everywhere. It seems like the obvious outcome given how humans function yeah it does like, how could you possibly avoid that yeah if the world isn't stable and you can't take it for granted everyone's good enough response is going to end up with a different answer and they're going to be rigid and stuck in it yeah you it's... go no we need to go this way no we need to go that way the only thing that they both agree on is that we need to go somewhere there isn't an obvious easy answer that everyone can agree on given what we've talked about um certainly in the first half of our conversation uh, you know i was talking about regulation Yes. And how we need external regulation to support ourselves when we live alone. Right. Because it's, you know, 2 a.m. and you're on TikTok and there is no one popping their head around the door going, dude, why are you on TikTok at 2 a.m.? Like, put it down, go do your tea, grab a glass of water and go to bed. Yeah. No one's doing that. Sunny Sunday afternoon, 2 p.m. No one's popping their head around the door going, uh, bike ride? You said you wanted to get something active this weekend. Yeah. That uh, ideally we'd have a person in our life or a tribe in our life that helped us do those things and regulate those things. But we don't. 
and we can't call all of our mates at 2 a.m. Some of us are lucky and can, but most of us can't. We can't hire therapists to be there 24-7. Our mums aren't going to do it for us. And frankly, our mums are probably overwhelmed by the demands of being a mum in the modern society anyway. So they're quite glad when you finally piss off and don't. <laughs> you're not home because they, they're all dysregulated and, and stuff. I think we put, again, too much pressure on mums and parents. So how can we help this given that not only is that the case, but these are actively trying to mess with you. They're, they're trying to make it worse because they want your attention. They want you to be scrolling at 2 a.m. because that's how they make their ad dollars. So I'm like, okay, we need to help people in addiction. So I started this with my addiction because I had quite strong addiction and so, you know, screwed up relationships. I needed help and um, I knew what it was and we knew what I needed to build. And it's taken me a while to name it as what it is, but it's basically a self-regulation AI buddy. No. It is a conversational partner that gives a fuck about you, if you excuse my French, but genuinely cares. I mean, like it's programmed to care by people who care. And yes, it's not a true entity. It's only a facsimile to you of a human conversation, but it's surprisingly effective. Like it actually works. You really respond very well to them psychologically. Our brains can't tell the difference too much. So if we program it to be really caring, people do experience that care. And what we needed to do is help you self-regulate. So jump in at the moment where you're dysregulating, 2 a.m. at tick, you know, TikTok 2 a.m. Be that regulation for you and help you decide what it is that you need to do and encourage you to do it. And that's basically the vision. Wow. You know, it's 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 your it's like a personal assistant. I used to call it the AI assistant for ADHD, but I think I really want to get this word self-regulation out there because I think it matters. Mm. And that's what it is. We can't regulate ourselves if we have triggered into an addiction loop on our phones. Our, you know, we will be dysregulated. Our dopamine will be dysregulated. Our limbic systems will be in fight or flight. We will be trying to regulate our nervous systems inefficiently in ways that actually are counterproductive. Yeah. And we can't break out of that by ourselves. And if you've got ADHD, you're particularly at risk for that. So we're going after ADHD as first because we think, you know, because that's they're the people who are madly at risk. And also there's just more and more of us for all the reasons I've said. Um, ultimately, it's basically everyone who's trying to deal with the modern digital world. We need external regulation. And if it's not going to be a human, how, how are we going to do it? We can't evolve it fast enough. Like, I wish we could, because if, if I could help people evolve that stuff really swiftly... <laughs> that would be that would be the ultimate goal i think the best thing that we can do is teach and support people to learn as much as is possible now and support the rest of it like people in wheelchairs it doesn't matter how many ramps you put up steps they're never going to eventually be a case where you can say right we can take the ramp away you, you know you've had a ramp for a year surely you can get up steps now it's like uh no i i, I will always need the ramp yeah so there's a degree where we can teach and support and help people become more self efficacious um, and there's a degree where it's like, yeah, and there's a limit. And where we hit the limit, let's be that external support that ideally a tribe would support, would provide, but we don't live in that world. So, And it's not perfect. You know, it's AI um, that has ethical questions. It's got, um, you know, functional questions. And I think it's important that we look at all those. But at the end of the day, it is the best that we've got. Yeah. Like this is the best tool available for us to do this, and especially with all the medication shortages at the moment. So yes, we'd, that's you're, what I'm yeah. trying to do. It's a really good point. How can people uh, access it? Where, where is it? Is it an app? Is it a website? At the moment, yeah. At the moment, it's uh, Android only. Oh, we are sick. very busy Android. raising funds. Nice. Where well, you can install it and give it a go. Um, it it's now. it's a it's kind of a prototype at the moment. So hand on heart, um, it's not quite doing everything that I really wanted to do yet. Um, we need to get funding to pay basically a bunch of developers to come along and like build the things because I know what we need to build. Um, I it, literally it's just a question of like manpower or firepower. You know, we need more developers building the feature set and improving the AI. But we are there with a prototype, uh, and it's publicly available at mycopilot.ai. So HTTPS mycopilot.ai. Literally, the name is the website, and. Uh, I can't see that actually. It is it. I don't know what I'm looking at. Okay, that's fine then. It's some. Uh, 
Is it the first woman that flew across the... Anyway, if you see this lady here... Yeah, no, that's what it is, yeah. I'm downloading that. Early access. That's that's the main logo, yeah. So, yeah, there's an early access out there. We're really busy. Uh, This version is about getting feedback. We've put something really simple out there that does a bit. So it's an AI. There's a spinner. So we're just trying to take um, overwhelm off the table, and it interrupts. There's trigger rules that jump in at certain times. So we've got lots of really good feedback. We know how we want to make it better. So I don't know if there's any funders listening, get in touch. If you're a rich ADHD who wants to help all the other ADHDers, get in touch because we've got an act. I literally know like someone that is very rich and may have ADHD. So I'm going to use this. Well, and let me talk I to will, them because... I will take it to him. Because and he, community. Because... Yeah. Well, let's have a chat about that. Um, okay, yeah. The other bit is community. I think ADHD is, like I say, we need community. We need to belong to each other and co-regulate. So I don't have this in the app yet, but I'm, anyone who's looking for like co-regulation, like I really want to create, I want my co-pilot to be a big part of that. Like, I think we need to hold people first in the moment of overwhelm where like in your personal life, but as we improve as I, I, like individually, as we come out of our addiction loop on of the internet, we're going to be looking for a more rich, fruitful engagement with the world. We need to put something there that's positive for them to engage. And at the moment, we redirect them to their better habits. So you set it up with your world and you say the things that you want to do and like the stuff that you've got to do. So you're, what do you really need to do and want to do? So that could be like the laundry or it can be make music. Um, we're going to remind you of those and encourage you and like switch your phone off and go, yeah, go do that. And if it's an app, like, if you want to listen to music, we'll link to Spotify and open Spotify for you. And if you've got to-do lists, we can open your to-do list for you. Like, so that's where we're today. Long term, um, I want it to be much more, uh, yeah, anything that helps people regulate, co-regulate is on the cards. And quite frankly, at some level, I fantasize that if we can shift the debate on how the internet fundamentally works and ai is a big part of this now like ad dollars in ai is going to be different like the whole model of the internet is changing economically given ai but also we've got like the european parliament's just um voted 38 to 1 to um introduce uh, legislation to regulate the internet harms because they're like the suicide rates for teenagers hockey sticks from the point that they have iPhones in their pockets. And the researchers who found that hockey stick have attributed that causally. They say that it's been caused by the phones. It's not just correlation. It's not accidental. It's causal. And that, I think, is terrifying. I mean, it literally like it hurts to be like, all these people killing themselves. And a lot of um, ADHDers um, are, you know, the kind of midlife crisis suicide um, spike, highly correlated with neurodiversity. Because we get to midlife crisis and go, I can't even do this. I can't. And that's where I was when I hit 40. I was like, I can't do this. And if it wasn't for my co-pilot, I may have done because I needed something to live for. Yeah. And that was because I don't have kids and I don't have a partner. That all came crashing down two weeks before I turned 40. Wow. So for me, this is a survival, a survival play for people with ADHD. I want to keep us alive. Because quite frankly, also, you know, no one's going to be solving climate change if they're playing Candy Crush all day. <laughs> like, we've got real problems that we need people to engage with. We've got a society we've got to kind of, like, evolve through. If we're all just disappearing into our phones, we have no hope of doing that. So I kind of want to change the whole internet, if I can. Like, so that operating systems, ISPs, and, you know, mobile providers and routers and all this stuff, they've got stuff in them that's built to go... Are you sure that you want to be engaging with this addictive behavior? Yeah, I know that the people who are selling this want your ad dollars, but it needs to be regulated. And we need to get teenagers off social media. Like, it just does so much harm. There's goods from it, but I think the harms outweigh the goods at the moment. Like, we don't let teenagers drink, smoke, drive cars. I think the internet and social media is even more dangerous than cars. So... I'd rather give a a kid a key to a car than such a movie.